In this video, I want to talk about the assumption of the normality of errors in the context of finite sample inference. And I'm going to do so by means of a couple of examples. On the left hand side here, we have a graph of the log of an individual's test score against their parental income. And we might think that as parental income increases, that the sort of average test score which an individual might achieve at a given test might tend to increase on average. And there are a whole number of reasons for why that might be the case. One of which is that parents which earn more money can afford to send their kids to better schools. And notice here on the left hand side that because we've taken a log of test scores, this y-axis variable is no longer bounded at zero. In fact, because we've taken a log, it can go all the way to minus infinity, even though test score itself is bounded at zero. Okay, and on this situation on the left-hand side, then perhaps it might be the case that sort of points are roughly normally distributed around the line. And I'm sort of emphasizing that by drawing a normal distribution at various levels of parental income. But in practice, what we would see if we were to sort of plot a number of points is that we would find a number of points which were near the line, and then perhaps a few points which tended to be a bit further away, but the whole sort of center of the distribution would be sort of clustered around the line. So perhaps this situation on the left-hand side, we could reason that our errors are at least sort of approximately normally distributed. Okay, let's now think about a circumstance where this almost certainly isn't the case. And the circumstance I'm sort of indicating here on the right is a graph of an individual's wages against their level of education. And note that in both of these circumstances, I'm actually gonna assume that all of the Gauss-Markov assumptions are satisfied. So under those conditions, OLS we know is still blue. Okay, so sort of getting back to the problem, on the right hand side, we have a graph of wage against an individual's level of education. But for this sort of population of individuals which we're considering, we're going to assume that there is some level of minimum wage and perhaps, you know, something like $7. And then we can sort of think about drawing a sort of line which, or a couple of lines which best represents our data. And we might think that below some sort of threshold level of education in terms of the number of years, that individuals tend on average to sort of be distributed either at the minimum wage, so they're sort of earning the minimum wage if they earn less than five years, and perhaps there are a few individuals which earn slightly more than the minimum wage, and then perhaps there are a load of individuals who earn nothing, so they're sort of at this sort of level at zero. And then perhaps after five years of education, we might then be able to assume that our points might at least be approximately normally distributed about the line. So perhaps sort of to the right of this threshold of five, we might be able to assume that the errors are normally distributed. But what about this segment where we're below this threshold level of education? What do the errors look like here? Well, if we were to sort of draw a graph of what the errors look like in this sort of left-hand side here, then we might sort of envision that to the sort of this side of the line, in other words, we have a positive error, that at least the errors might be approximately normally distributed. But what about to this side of the line? So when we have a negative error, well, we know that there's no way that anyone can sort of earn in this sort of economy, which we're talking about here, sort of $6.7 an hour, at least legally. So perhaps we just have a whole load of people who are earning the minimum wage, and then we don't have any people between the minimum wage until we get to an error of minus seven, where we have a sort of whole conglomeration of people who are unemployed. And um, when we draw out the distribution like this, it becomes a, quite apparent why this situation on the right hand side is likely to have sort of non normally distributed errors. So why do we care? Why is this important that we assume that we have sort of normally distributed errors? Because remember, we talked about the central limit theorem before, which meant that as our sample size went to infinity, we could at least assume that beta was asymptotically, or beta hat was asymptotically normally distributed. But if we have a small sample size, so let's say we have a sample size which is less than around 30, 
then we can't actually rely on the central limit theorem. So the actual assumption of having normal errors actually matters a hell of a lot for inference. And if we sort of compare and contrast the two situations of normally versus non-normally distributed errors, it will become apparent why it is so important. So this situation here on the left-hand side, because we have assumed that our errors are normally distributed, it turns out that the sampling distribution of beta hat is exactly normally distributed. And note the word exactly. I haven't sort of invoked any sort of asymptotic distribution. It happens that if our errors are exactly normally distributed, then beta hat itself is normally distributed. And because we've assumed that the Gauss-Markov conditions are true, we know that beta hat is unbiased. So we know that it's going to be normally distributed around the true population parameter beta. So how do we proceed here on the left-hand side for inference? Well, it's quite easy, actually. We can actually form a statistic, which we call the t-statistic, which if we take the beta hat and then we take off the true, true population parameter, and then we divide through by the standard error in beta hat, because we don't actually know the exact um, population variant, we only know a sort of, we can only estimate that. That's why we sort of have the standard error here rather than the standard deviation. But in the circumstance where our errors are normally distributed, then it turns out that this sort of t-statistic we have formed here is exactly t-distributed with n minus k minus 1 degrees of freedom. So we can actually proceed exactly as we did before when we invoke the central limit theorem. But note that the difference between here and that of the central limit theorem sort of results is that beta hat in this circumstance here is exactly normally distributed. And the sort of t statistic that we form here is also exactly t distributed. And this is completely different to the situation where we use the approximation of the central limit theorem. We can only then say that beta hat is approximately normally distributed. And only in the circumstance where our sample size gets very big or in principle n goes to infinity. So the left-hand side is easy enough. We can just proceed as we always have done when we sort of assumed that we were sort of using the central limit theorem results. But how do we proceed on the right-hand side here? What can we say about the distribution of our sort of errors in this circumstance? Well, almost certainly we can't say that the errors are normally distributed. And because of that, and because let's say we're assuming that we have a small sample size, we can't say that beta hat is normally distributed either. So how do we actually go ahead and proceed here? Because we can't actually just form our t-statistic in this circumstance, because the t-statistic we form won't even remotely resemble a sort of t-distribution in terms of its sampling distribution. So how would we proceed here on the right-hand side? Well, the answer is that generally we hope that we have a sample size which is sort of above 30 or in principle goes up sort of above around 100, in which case we can use the central limit theorem and then we can at least talk about beta hat being asymptotically distributed normally. And under those circumstances, we can then sort of proceed with sort of approximate inference statistics. And that's different to the left-hand side where we assume to sort of exact inference statistics. So how do we proceed on the right-hand side where our sample size is less than, let's say, around 30? Well, then we actually have to consider the specific distribution of the errors in question. And in principle, we could formulate sort of non-normal inference statistics here, which we could then use for inference. But to be honest, non-normal inference is beyond the scope of this course, so we won't really talk about that further. In principle, in most circumstances, it's okay we have a sufficient sample size that we can invoke the central limit theorem. So at least we've got that to sort of back up when we have a sufficient sample size. So a question you might have here is that why could we assume on the left-hand side that just because we could have normally distributed errors, that we actually do have normally distributed errors. Well, one theoretical reason might be that you can sort of think about the composite error, which we see here on the left-hand side, as being made up of 
a sort of sum of individual in idiosyncratic errors. And in principle, there would sort of be an infinite number of these idiosyncratic errors. And each of these particular errors might have themselves a particular type of distribution. But it just so happens if I have enough of these sort of idiosyncratic errors and they're additive, then we can invoke the central limit theorem and then our error might then, at least asymptotically, be normally distributed. But notice that this is an asymptotic result and also notice the fact that if I now relax this assumption and sort of consider the situation where there is, let's say, some multiplicative relationship between the individual errors on the right-hand side of our sort of composite error, then the central limit theorem no longer holds. So there's sort of a very weak theoretical reason for why our error might itself be normally distributed. And in principle, it, we don't actually really consider the sort of theory behind why our errors might be normally distributed. We just sort of test for it practically. And that's what we're going to consider in the next video, how we go about testing for normally distributed errors.